Thank you very much. The title of my talk and the address that I want to make to you involves the word European. But really what I want to talk about is how the industry in Estonia fits in to the European story. But also what I'd like to do is to sort of set the context of what we'll be talking about for the rest of uh, today, I believe, about some of the challenges that our industry faces. Our industry, both from the geologic perspective but also from the mining perspective, is constantly changing, constantly transforming, but also constantly feels the stress of many different actors. So we'll talk a bit, little bit about uh, some of those stresses and so forth. Natural resources in Estonia, of course, have been around for a long time. They've uh, contributed to make this country what it is today. And it really provided the fuel and the economic drive uh, for some of our greatest developments. We use sophisticated technologies. We have very, very highly skilled labor. And we have a very special and unique geologic endowment. But this sector needs to be nurtured. It will not be around forever as we see it. And we need to be thinking about the transformation of our industry. But first, what I'd like to do is to sort of go back a little bit and talk about what we're here for. Really, what are we here for? What is the mineral sector and natural resources sector here for in Estonia and really in Europe and really the world in general? And that is prosperity. Natural resources development really has always been the first building block of a society. It is the mother of society's infrastructure. It is the bread of our communities. It is the sculptor of our landscapes. Well, most important, mining and mineral development has a very, very special place in our lives. And that is, this is the creator of value for the very first time. There is no other sector in anybody's economy where we take something from the ground that has almost zero value in the ground and through intelligence, through engineering, through the application of capital, we're able to take it out of the ground and create something valuable for the very first time. This isn't a service job where we recycle money. We're creating value for the very first time. And this is a very, very special thing. And I talk to students all the time and tell them about the special responsibility that they have in creating wealth and prosperity for our communities and our nations. A big part of what we do involves people. And we'll talk about people a little bit more. But what we do is commonly under pressure by, and I think I heard in one of the addresses in Estonian the word NIMBY, I'm not sure. Yeah. But commonly we're under pressure because of our relationship with society. In earlier days, mining was just part of the way we did things and people just sort of accepted what went on, particularly in the community level. But things are changing and changing for the right reasons. Now we have to have, as an industry, a relationship with the local community. And this has been identified or characterized as social license. And really, it's a metaphor. It's not a real thing. It's not a piece of paper that says, I have social license to work in your communities. But it's a metaphor that describes or characterizes this level of trust that exists between the company or the industrial proponent and the stakeholders in the local community. It's a level of trust that is manifested or is exercised as treating the local community and stakeholders as equal partners in your project. The days are long gone where the company comes into town and says, hi, we're the company, we're here to help you, we're gonna give you jobs, and oh, by the way, you've gotta move your house. Or we're gonna build a mine or a pit beside your house and Sorry about the blasting. Those days are long gone. 
So we have to be mindful of those things. At the top of the little pyramid, we talk about benefit sharing. Long gone are the days when the company takes it all and there's nothing left other than a few scattered jobs for the local community. Now the community is an equal partner economically as well as in trust. It's about engagement. It's about how we talk to the local community and the other stakeholders. It's a relationship. We also have to have legal and procedural fairness. That if something goes wrong or something requires a discussion, that there is a legal framework that treats the community and the stakeholders on an equal basis with the industrial proponent. Things are changing. And finally, dispute resolution. That there is a mechanism between you as an industrial proponent and the stakeholders where if there is a problem, that there's a way to work that problem out. And that in essence, there's an equal sharing of decision-making power between all of the stakeholders. The big question with Natural Resources, and Estonia is a great case in point, is this notion or this idea of consume now or consume later. And I don't know if many of you are aware, hopefully you are aware, the United Nations came out with a handful of, of uh, sustainable development goals. Well, this is probably one of my favorites. Number 12. And that really is talking about sustainable production. That we're promoting production of resources in such a way that are, is energy efficient, that we allow access to basic services, and that the production provides what I refer to as green jobs, or jobs that are safe, jobs that improve people's livelihoods, improves lifestyles, improves local living conditions. So it's all about this sustainable production, doing more with less. The focus really here is increasing economic gain by actually reducing resource use or using the resource in a different way. It's about managing land degradation and pollution and minimizing this idea of waste throughout the whole value chain or throughout the whole economy. This magic snail diagram is really, really common these days, particularly within the EU countries. This is the circular economy. And it's critical that the inputs that really come from your hard work and my mining brethren, that the amount of waste is minim minimalized, but also the waste actually doesn't become waste anymore. That the waste actually becomes a value-added product. And I think we can all sit in this room and think of examples here in Estonia where that can happen. The other thing is this idea, particularly in the Estonian context, of what I refer to as external sustainability. It's not about sustaining our industry as such, but it's sustaining, sustaining an external presence. We know that we here in Estonia are starting to feel the pressure from outside about our natural resources sector. The elephant in the room, of course, is emissions and CO2 production. It's unfortunate that the largest component of our energy source comes from a highly CO2 generating product. So over time, we will start feeling the pressure on our oil shale sector as a fuel and our electrical generation uh, capacity from people like the EU. So it's critical that we're starting to think about how we're using our natural resources and what other natural resources might be available to us. I talk about this idea of sustainability and I kind of want to take a little detour for a moment and talk about sustainability. Because I think if you go on to Google 
and you type in sustainable development or sustainability, you get almost 2,000 different definitions of the topic. 2,000. So if we have 2,000 definitions of one word, how can we all collectively agree? How can we all collectively act in a more sustainable manner? Me personally, I like the first one from the early 1990s by Brundtland, Ho Gar Garland Brundtland. In her report, Our Common Future. And it's all about maintaining a lifestyle but without negatively impacting the lifestyles of the future generations. That's a paraphrase. I think that's a pretty fair assumption. We can continue to use our resources, but use our resources in such a way that it doesn't negatively impact the future. This is my magic green diagram, and unfortunately it doesn't really show very well in the light. <laughs> but it really talks about what I think are these spheres of relationships between important aspects that make up this idea of sustainability. The first ring is governance, which really means the rules of the game. It's important that we have rules that are reflective of the values of our community, but also do not negatively impact the ability for us to produce and develop natural resources. We all live in a community the community is this thing. It's made up of a very diverse group of actors and individuals that have different values, different timelines, different motives, but we all work together. And then inside of that, we have these elements that I believe really are the critical elements that determine whether our activities are sustainable or not. And that would be the impact on diverse, uh, biodiversity, Water, which is arguably the most critical input of any natural resource development. In fact, the most critical element facing humanity today. Because without water, what happens? We die. So it's critical about our water resources. It's about wise use of energy. It's also about this notion of material stewardship, which I'll talk about in a moment. But at the end of the day, sustainability, the center is people. It's all about people. The biosphere is sustainable by, themselves, by itself. It was sustainable long before people started walking on this earth. But sustainability, the notion is all about people. So when we talk about community, we have to be really mindful that in order for us to carry out what we do, we have to do it in a way that is collaborative and in a self-defined way. The community is a partner, and you have to make sure that you minimize or moderate the negative impacts that happen. Environmental degradation. Most communities, if not all communities, have an unusual, uh, unusual is a bad word, has an attachment to the land, a unique attachment to the land. Perhaps a lot different than yours. My backyard is far more important than it is to you. <laughs> and the squirrels, of course. There's stresses. When we go into a community, there's stresses on social infrastructure and health services, for example. If we decide we want to build a mineral development and we bring in a thousand foreign workers to build our mining infrastructure, that's going to stress housing, health, roads, it's going to stress people culturally, I'm sure. So we have to be mindful of that. And often what we'll do by coming into some communities in some locations is we'll start interfering and in interrupting subsistence existence and change and move towards this economic dependence on what you are. Because all minds close at the end of the day. So you have to manage and be mindful of this development of dependence. Of course, people. It's our role as industrial proponents is to develop people and engage people and a workforce in such a way that they can leave a, lead a sustainable livelihood in a healthy way. 
We have to embed a culture of safety. We have to embed a culture of learning. And we have to constantly be thinking about operational excellence and how we're going to do it better and safer. Water, as I said, is the most precious resource on Earth. And it is critical. It is our job. It's our moral imperative that when we use water, we use it wisely, and we do it in such a way that is equitable with all stakeholders. And there's a division, there's a sharing between the social, economic, recreational, and cultural benefits of that water. Biodiversity, it will always be an issue. This was probably the first issue we ever really thought about in terms of sustainability. But it's critical that if we are going to carry out what we do, whether it is carrying out a drill program, a trenching program, developing a mine, or closing a mine, we have to leave a positive net benefit impact on our land. Because the truth is, they don't make land anymore. Maybe they do in deltas and things, but generally speaking, we don't make land anymore. So we have to preserve and look after what we have. Energy is critical as well. That we have to be mindful of the kind of energy that we're using. We have to look towards smart energy mining operations. Using less energy and comminution or the crushing and grinding of rocks. The making of big rocks into little rocks. And material stewardship is critical. This is about the circular economy. This is about maximizing the benefits of the products that we make that provide a service or helps drive our societies, but also minimizing the impact on people and the environment. And what we have to do is think about the products that we produce throughout the entire product life cycle. At what point in time do we, as producers of raw materials, lose control or lose responsibility for that commodity? There's a school of thought out there now that we actually never lose responsibility as producers of raw materials. That we are responsible for taking it out of the ground and we track that product all the way through the value cycle and through the circular economy and actually take it back as a recycled product and upcycle it into another product or the similar product in the case of metals. But we actually start adding value to our waste stream. So no longer do we produce a concentrate or produce a product, put it on the truck or put it on a train and kiss it goodbye. That doesn't exist anymore. The world is changing and we have to change too. I talked about governance at the onset, and this is really setting up rules and regulations such that everybody is legally a beneficiary of the natural resources of the country. Who owns the resources is always the question. And again, I come from Canada where we are constantly in a dialogue with our First Nations. Because arguably, they may own the resources. Does the crown own the resources? Does the company own the resources? Does the community own the resources? What is that relationship? So it's really important for us to understand who owns the resources and how we can share the benefits and, again, the creation of that value from the development of those resources. So in order to develop a nur and nurture a resource sector, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. There's some things that we have to start thinking about. About the long-term sustainability of our economy that's related to mineral resources, the sustainability of the companies that carry out those resources, the sustainability of the livelihoods of the stakeholders. All of these things have to be planned out. And what we need to do is to prioritize. We have to prioritize that natural resource development that reflects both the domestic need and our export opportunities. 
because really there's two sides of the coin, generally speaking, with natural resources. We tend to use a lot domestically, but we also realize there's an export value. So the planning of when you bring these resources on stream, how you plan for it throughout the entire economy is critical. One of the things to start thinking about and to consider is the role of state-owned enterprises, but also how do you bring foreign investment into your resources sector? Foreign investment is a good thing, don't be afraid. Foreign investment brings capital that you may not necessarily have ready to put into your sector, but it also increases the stock of real capital, of money. It puts money into the local or the national economy, which benefits everybody. Foreign investment could also accelerate employment, which is a good thing. What it also does is it reduces some economic disparities between leading and lagging sectors. You may have a sector that is burning hot. I would say forestry, but that would be just too easy. You don't want to burn the forestry industry. But you, for example, the forestry industry may be really roaring, but your minerals industry is somewhat lagging. But by bringing uh, foreign investment in, you can start evening out that disparity, disparity and having an economy that is balanced. Because when you think about it, the mining industry is probably one of the most vulnerable, particularly in export markets. Because mining doesn't set the price. It's one of the craziest industries out there. Crazy industry. I don't know why we do it. Because we have no control over the price of the commodity. We're known as a price taker, not a price setter. We just show up at the person who's buying our commodity and go, here, how much are you going to give me for this? Which is ridiculous. There's no other industry out there, like, at all. So we have to be able to balance any sort of market variability in our commodity and in our sector relative to other sectors for equal and even economic development. One of the other things that we need to nurture and to grow our natural resource sector, particularly in Estonia, which I'm aware of, is access to high quality geologic data. That's your job, all right? That is your job. Currently in Europe, which is this great tapestry of cultures, there's a lot of geologic data in a number of online platforms, such as the European Geologic Data Infrastructure Base, but due to cutbacks in funding, many of the member states and geologic surveys have stopped producing primary geologic data. This is the data that companies require to go do their job. Exploration companies, and most certainly mining companies, aren't going out there to do field mapping. They're not going to go out there and try to track mineral occurrences. That's your job as a geologic survey, for example, is to produce that kind of data and make it available. There's a lot of Eastern and post-Soviet countries that have heaps and heaps of data, lots and lots of data. It's amazing data that's out there. But they haven't quite developed a way to get it into the public domain. There are examples where you have a division of where the data exists. And you have ministries and organizations that are constantly fighting against each other. I own this data, you can, you know, I own this data. And they don't get together. You will not attract foreign investment into your mining sector unless you can provide a database that is unified and accessible. GTK in Finland and SGU have been very, very successful at this. And as we can see, Finland and Sweden are booming in terms of early stage exploration. Not only from domestic companies, but a lot of foreign investment at this point in time. The next thing that we need to be mindful of in developing the sector is mining rights management. In places like Australia and Canada, 
we have mining cadastres, which basically capture what mining licenses and expiration permits are out there and basically provo provide the authority for granting access to these projects. In Europe, it's very, very uneven that each country obviously has jurisdiction over their own natural resources. And some countries do have a unified cadaster, some don't. So it's really important to be able to present to the public a unified way of representing what lands are available and what lands are not. This is a big one. This is the right to mine and tenure of, uh, security of tenure. Again, in places like Canada and Australia, it's generally assured that if we're the first on the ground and it's free, we can carry out exploration. But there are places where that doesn't exist in Europe. This idea of first come, first served is not equally, or equally or evenly applied. In some places, the regulators say, you can have it, you can't have it. In some places, it's a negotiation. So you have to negotiate with the government as an individual company saying, you know, I am experienced, I know what I'm doing, can I please have this permit? Ireland is the case in point. The graph on the side is kind of an interesting little story that you can see that Europe doesn't sort of feature particularly high. Northern Europe isn't so bad. Central and Eastern Europe is getting a little bit further down the track in terms of this idea of investor security. And the next thing that we have to be very efficient in terms of developing our sector is this idea of converting exploration to mining licenses. And in the event that you want to transfer your mining license from one company to, to another, that it's done relatively easily. Again, in most European countries, that's relatively simple and relatively e evenly applied. But sometimes that isn't the case. Generally speaking, you have to make sure that the parties can fulfill their technical obligations that are usually presented in some sort of feasibility report. And that usually is enough. But again, in some ju jurisdictions, the transfer of mining licenses or the granting of mining licenses is done by a, by a at the ministry level, and it's determined on whether the project serves the public good. So we start adding that other social dimension into what would normally be a, a commercial relationship. In some countries, that they will actually not grant the transfer of mining, lights, mining rights or leases because it's not in the public interest. And they would actually keep that work that you've done to themselves and essentially and effectively expropriate your project. This is the big one. And we're seeing this actually becoming more and more prevalent here in Estonia. And that's idea of the public perception of mining. We're getting better. Right? We put a lot of effort in to talk about, oh, we, again, I don't have my cell phone. I hold my cell phone up. Yes, there's 72 or 73 elements. These are really important. And life would be over if we didn't mine things. I'm getting, I personally am getting kind of tired of these metaphors. But the general public is starting to get the idea that mining and natural resource development is important. We haven't got over the fact that they still see it as a dirty, low-tech, unsafe, and certainly undesirable activity. As a professor at a university, our lifeblood are young students. And it's critical, critical, that we accurately portray our sector, both from the geology side and the mining side, is one that is high-tech that is safe, that you actually can go home to your own bed if you choose, right? This is the critical message that we have to tell our people and tell our public and tell your neighbor that mining is good, mining is important. Not just hold up your cell phone. We're seeing a lot of activism that we've never seen before. 
and it's only going to get greater and greater and greater. This is thanks largely to social media, where information travels very, very quickly, that the latest tweet becomes fact or truth, that everybody's opinion is considered equal. Misinformation travels just as fast as the real information. And we're seeing changes, and we're seeing much, much more opposition. And again, in the, in the Nordic countries, we see Northland, uh, the Northland incident where the project was shut down and the uh, permits were not granted. Nordic and Beowulf's Kallik Iron project is probably, uh, I can't really say because I don't know, but there, there's a lot of challenges to them getting their licenses, if at all. Okay, so again, this is part of that opposition. NGOs are becoming far more sophisticated and we're seeing that here in Estonia as well. So we have to be mindful. It's about how we represent what we do. So in order to transform our economy, we have to kind of consider some of, uh, a few things here. Eston I call this Estonia's infrastructure promise. And promise isn't the promise that I give to you, I promise that I will deliver something. This is the promise of potential. This is the, the idea that we have something awesome. This is our promise, our future. And we have a couple of rather large infrastructure projects on the, uh, on the table. Whether they come to fruition or not, there is this potential. I think Rail Baltica is moving forward in some fashion. It's going to require a tremendous amount of raw materials. And it's critical that we here in Estonia are in the forefront with our wheelbarrows, with our trucks, saying, here are the raw materials to build this. We have them. Whether we're going to mine them or whether we're going to recover them as post-industrial waste products. The tunnel, the magic tunnel, the Angry Bird tunnel. I think that's going to be the logo is an Angry Bird. I'm not sure. It's a great idea. It's a huge infrastructure project. It's going to require a tremendous amount of natural resources. But more importantly, it's going to re require the skills that our young people are developing. Right? It's the intellectual smarts. Estonia is amazing at mobilizing technology and intellect. I drive to work a couple of days a week when my wife doesn't need the car. And I had to go buy a car that had really high wheel clearance because, of, and I couldn't buy a BMW, which I was told I had to have. So I bought a Volvo. And I bought a Volvo with big wheel clearance because of avoiding the potholes when I drive to work. Estonia is facing a crisis in terms of aging infrastructure. And we have to be thinking about how we're providing the raw materials to help fix that infrastructure. Again, whether it's new materials or whether it's upcycled former materials or waste products, it's critical. But then it's the new economy infrastructure, right? This is the cool part. This is what you're good at. We have to think about different ways in which we're using our mineral resources that we have today and in the future in order to build that future infrastructure that we require. I love this picture, by the way. I couldn't find the reference, but it was really cool. There will be an ultimate shift away from oil shale generated electricity. May not necessarily be in my lifetime, but in the fullness of time, there will be sufficient external pressure on Estonia to say, you've got to come up with a better way of doing it. Estonia is actually meeting its emission uh, levels where it should be, but I'm not sure how long the European Union is going to put up with burning fossil fuels to produce electricity. Great steps have been made to, produce, uh, to develop renewable energy systems. 
in a country like Estonia, which is relatively small in terms of population, this is very, very doable. And maybe oil shale is too valuable to burn. Have you ever thought about that? Maybe some of the other products that we produce or can produce from oil shale has a much greater value added level than what we're taking advantage of. I always say this, again, coming from Australia where coal is huge, I always say, well, maybe coal is too valuable to burn. Maybe there's other chemicals and other things that we can extract that has a much greater value than burning the coal. It's Australia. So other resources in, in Estonia have to become more prominent because oil shale will not be there forever. We can improve mining methods because mining methods that are being used today are leaving a tremendous amount of material underground. The resource is shrinking as a, just physically because we're mining it. So yes, we have to mine it smarter, but we also have to think about other resources and they have to be part of the bigger picture. So we have to be thinking out of the box. As I said, Estonia is known this is your gift that you think outside of the box. The one I'll highlight is phosphorite. This is my fave. Phosphorite and phosphates have a tremendous pr promise in this country. It is really the next major mineral element or mineral product that will take over. And we have to be thinking about it now. It has export potential. It's a relatively high quality, but we have some knowledge gaps and we need to start addressing those gaps now. Not all phosphorites are the same. Okay, so we have to understand that. We have to unify what we know from historic data and update that data using modern analytical techniques. But we also have to start thinking about actually how are we gonna mine this? Are we gonna mine it the same way that we mined oil shale? Or are there other ways? Other ways that we haven't even thought of yet, right? We have time, we're in that window where we can think about creative extraction methodologies, not only the metallurgical extraction of the, material, the, the elemental materials that we need, but also the physical extraction. We have that time now. One way of dealing with this, and this is something I encourage, and this is, I'm actually paid to say this, is this idea of the innovation triangle. And this is something that we need to do better at and we need to promote and foster, not only here in Estonia, but all of Europe. This is kind of a, a weird diagram that I created that talks about the idea of relationships between really the three, three important partners, I suppose, in the structural development and the maintenance of our mining sector here in, in Estonia. And is that relationship and that partnership between the exploration company, research institutions like the Geologic Survey, and academia like Taltec. And is this relationship and this sharing of ideas that help develop and emerge these new techniques that I talk about, whether it's a mining technique, a metallurgical technique, a modeling technique for something like facies of phosphorites, right? But it's this partnership and this relationship. And what it does is it smooths out some of the uneven, uh, unevenness of, of the things I talked about before. There's power. There's power in these partnerships. We know we know here in Estonia, but conversations I have with my colleagues back in Canada and in Australia are surprised at the mineral wealth that is contained here in Estonia. They had no idea. First, they don't know where Estonia is, but you know, I guess you're kind of used to that. But they're amazed at the mineral values that we have here. There are lots and lots of opportunities to enhance the Estonian experience. And this is through partnerships between the company, academia, 
and the research institutes. And what these partnerships do is bring together numerous stakeholders. And ultimately, it will preserve, enhance, and sustain a vibrant mineral sector in Estonia. We know Estonia is endowed with a unique bounty of mineral resources, most of which have seen some level of development. There's an opportunity to capitalize on Estonian skills, expertise, and to make current production more efficient and effective, lower cost, higher productivity, greater utilization of the resource. There's an opportunity to develop a capacity and capability of waste management and turn this mining waste or post-industrial waste into a new resource and move towards social acceptance and most importantly, foster and earn social license and ultimately to optimize uh, environmental performance. Right there.